Um, let's get started. John chapter 14 is where we're going to start. Now, what we're doing here, we've been looking at uh, the how to enjoy the Bible. We're going to conclude that study this morning. This is lesson number eight. And uh, we've been covering the whole of the Bible. And uh, we haven't been able to get into every little detail. And that's okay. That's for, for use. Uh, covering the whole of it. Uh, again, we can't cover every detail, but if, if you can grasp and understand the Scriptures and you can begin to comprehend what the Scriptures are in the totality, then when you get into those details, you begin to know where to put them. If you think about the Scriptures like a puzzle, okay, a thousand-piece puzzle, all right, you know, I got mine done faster than anybody. It said three to five years. I was done. Boom. Okay. Uh, oh, you guys wake up now. Come on. Okay. If you think about a puzzle, you, you know, you put the pieces out. You've got the picture, and you put all this color over here, and you put all this over here, and then you do what? You begin to put it together, and that's similar to what we've been doing here with the scriptures over these last eight studies. If you can get a grasp of the picture of, of the big, then you can get a piece of that puzzle. You might not understand it. You might have struggle with it. And you just set it over there, and then one day, as the puzzle becomes clearer, then that piece kind of fits in. So as we come to God's Word, we come to it the way God would have us come to it. The Apostle Paul, in Ephesians chapter number 2, he talks about a time past. He talks about a but now. And then he talks about an ages to come, but now, ages to come. And he uses that terminology, past, present, and future. And, and really, that's the simplicity of it. Back here in time past, we were looking from Genesis to Malachi, and we looked at that Old Testament and that issue of prophecy and that, that underlining characteristics of the difference between the circumcision and the uncircumcision, Israel and everybody else. And as you begin to lay that out, you begin to see, we begin to see that the operating system was the law. The people group is Israel, the law, and that's what God was using and working through. And the thing is, is back here, there's a kingdom going to be prophesied. And as that kingdom is laid out and as that kingdom is prophesied and it begins to work out, then we come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John right on time, right where the Messiah is now going to be presented to the nation of Israel. And then not only do we stay in circumcision, uncircumcision, not only do we still stay under the law, but now that kingdom is at hand. And now there is an at hand moment. And then when we came through the the Acts period, there's an offer of the kingdom to Israel. By the way, there's also a fall of Israel and then salvation going out to the Gentiles through the Apostle Paul and a new dispensation. And that brings us to Romans to Philemon. And in Romans to Philemon, we find the doctrine and the information pertaining to what God is doing today in the ages of grace. And the fact is today that Galatians 3 says there is no difference between circumcision and uncircumcision. There is no, where there is a difference back here, that middle wall of partition, that dividing wall has been torn down, has been eliminated, has been done away with. Now it's grace. This was prophesied, talked about since the world began. This is mystery. This was kept secret since the world began, but it was also kept secret before the world began. And now we're over here. This is what God's doing today in the age of grace. Then we're here this morning, Hebrews to Revelation. Now one day the, the church goes home. The Lord returns, takes us home. We go back to prophecy. We go back to the kingdom being established. We go back to the very fact that God, what he interrupted, he's now going to finish. He, there, think about this. There's a difference between circumcision and uncircumcision. Then there's no difference. Now there's what? A difference. Why? See, that, that's the Why? Well, he's got books to write about it. 
to explain to it. These books, Hebrews to Revelation, are written back here with an understanding of over here for them. They're going to need some information. So the whole of the scripture, you grasp the, whole, the system, the whole of it. And as we begin to look this morning at Hebrews to Revelation, we're going to talk about wrath and the kingdom being established and, and, and things happening and so forth. And when you begin to see the whole of Scripture, what you real quickly learn that is if you just went to the index of your Bible, you know where that is, right, in the very beginning, you would read the edification process. You go there and you look at the, the index of your, of your, if you just read your Scripture, guess what you did? You followed the system that God had placed in the Scriptures. Just reading God's Word. Then you'll get the edification that is there. Well, we see how God put his word together. We see God's wisdom as he's placed the books together the way they are. And this morning, John 14, as we come to Hebrews to Revelation, we see something from the earthly ministry, okay, that's going to shine some light in on these epistles. Now, just real quick, we'll shut this. That's the way it was designed. And then he interrupted with the age of grace. And here's the conclusion, okay? Look at John 14 and just grasp what's happening here in the earthly ministry of the Lord. John 14, verse oh, 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is, of the Holy, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, we're in the upper room. Let, get the picture where we're at. The, Lord, the night before Calvary in the upper room, John 13, 14, 15, 16, and then out in 17, they go into the garden, the real Lord's Prayer. But in, four, in 13 to 16, they're in the upper room. A big chunk of the Gospel of John happens in the upper room where the Lord is simply talking to the apostles, no one else, the leaders of the little flock. And he begins to talk to them. Now, Judas is going to go and do the betrayal. So there's the 11 of them sitting there. And he begins to teach them. And here in verse 26, he preauthorizes the writing of the Gospels. How are they going to be brought? The Holy Ghost, the Comforter, he's going to teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. There's the Gospels. Those Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John preauthorized to be written. Come over to chapter 16 of John. John 16, verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things, what? To come. That verse right there preauthorizes the writing of Hebrew through Revelation. Hebrews through Revelation. So back here in the Lord's, he, he's going to Calvary. What is he authorizing? The writing of the gospel accounts and the writing of some information that these folks are going to need because there's going to be a delay and we got to get it going. And they're going to need some help. So we'll see that as we go. Come over to Hebrews chapter number 2. I just want you to catch this morning about Hebrews. Again, we're not going to get every little detail. And, I'm, I'm not, and that's by design. I just want you to get, if you can grasp a, a whole of it, an overview of it. And these eight lessons that we've had, I, I've tried to be mindful of the time and so forth. Because when you grasp that, then you can go in and you can study and you can fit the detail that you're working on. Hebrews chapter 2. The authorization of the writing of Hebrews through Revelation. When the coming of that Holy Spirit comes, 
He's going to give them the capacity to understand something that back here in time past, they couldn't do it. That's what verse 12 said in John 16. I got more to say, but you can't handle it now. He's going to come, and he's going to cause you to write it. So there's some Hebrews to Revelation is going to be written back here, okay? Why? Because there's some things out here that they got to get ready for, all right? Now, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Hebrews 2, 3. And what you begin to understand as we do this, I'm hoping, is that in the Hebrews, in the Hebrew epistles, Hebrews to Revelation, they're going to focus not back here, but they're going to focus out here. They're being written back here, focusing out here. And it's literally going to be a continuation of their program. Okay? There's, they're, they don't, they're not writing about an interruption of 2,000 years. The only place you understand that in the Hebrew epistles is in 2 Peter 3. And we'll talk about him and that in just a little bit. They're literally writing because this is what's next on their calendar. Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse number 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? All right, what's the great salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Spoken of by the Lord. There, well, how do we know that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's the gospel. And was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. There's early acts. By the way, early acts is a continuation of the Gospels. There's not a stop and a new start. There's nothing. It's a continuation of it. Verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof, what? We speak. Now, John 16, the Holy Ghost is going to come. He's going to tell you some things about things to come. And then Hebrews picks right up with that and says, now we're going to be talking about the to come, the things that are coming. God knew, God the Father knew that there was going to be an interruption by the dispensation of grace. The Father knew that. He knew it was going to last a while. Now, he knows how long it's going to last. We just know it's 2,000 years so far. And he knew that there was going to be a need for some scriptures to be written to explain to that little flock as they are going through the 70th week of Daniel and into the kingdom and the finishing up of their program, why the delay was there and what was going on in their program in light of the advanced revelation given to the Apostle Paul. Okay? Now, the reason I say God the Father is because the Son's doing His job and the Spirit's doing His job, but this is God the Father's plan. Remember in John, He said He's not going to speak of Himself. He's going to speak of the things that He heard. See, the Spirit's hearing the Father speak, causing it to be communicated down line. So God in His wisdom causes some books to be written in the Acts period that will focus in on the ages to come, the world to come. And Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 5, tells us that's where they focus. Okay? Now, let's bow our heads, close our mind in prayer, and have a great day. All right? I wish it was that simple. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. What are we going to be talking about? By the way, Hebrews, who's that written to? Hebrews. Duh. Ah, it's brilliant. Scholarly. Okay. Now, come back to chapter 1. I just want to run through some verses with you in the Hebrew epistle so you see what they're focusing in on. Okay. And their focus here is really evident. It's very clear. Hebrews 1, verse 1. God, by the way, who wrote Hebrews? God did. God, who at sundry times and in divers' manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these, what? What days? So where are we going to be talking about? The last days. Spoken unto us by his Son, 
whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. By the way, when the Son spoke back here, you know what those are called in that verse? Last days. Read that verse too, careful. Spoken in these last days, spoken unto us by his Son. When did he speak? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Last days. What are they talking about? Last days, the end of Israel, the, the last days of Israel's program. So it's focusing in on the to come time period, focusing in on the last stage of Israel's program, the prophetic program. It's spoken back here, it's confirmed here, and it's carried out over here. And the Hebrews begins to draw in and lay in some of the details. Come over to James, James chapter 5. James 5. By the way, I cut these down to just one verse here and there, okay? Otherwise, you would have, I mean, there's just oogles and oogles and googles of verses that we could have been looking at. James 5. Look at verse 7. James 5, verse 7. James 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. That's not this coming. He's done come. It's this coming. Be patient unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early, early rain and the latter rain. Amen. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth not. What is he focusing in on? The coming of the Lord. Verse 9, grudge not one against another. Behold, uh, I'm sorry, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Who's the judge? The Lord is. When does he judge? Second coming. Where are we? Fo Verse 10, take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Endure to what? Endure to the end to be saved. They endure down through the suffering and the afflictions and the patiently waiting for it. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. The patience of Job. Somebody out here is teaching them the book of Job. So when you go to Job, Job, when you go to Job, okay, and you read Job, don't think he's a little fairy tale, little devotional ditty for you. He's talking about and to the little flock as they go through the 70th week of Daniel over there. And you know what they begin to do? They begin to lose it all. They go through the persecution. Job's wife looks at him and says, just curse God and die. Do you know that that's what people are going to say to them over here in the 70th week? Just curse God and die. By the way, how do they curse God? They take the mark of the beast. Ooh, spooky. By the way, it wasn't COVID shots. Sorry. Bust your bubble, okay? Sorry. That, that was other stuff. You see, when you read Job, what are you learning? What what, how does Job end? Do you remember? The double blessings of the kingdom. He gets it all back. That's what, they, that's what James is going to focus in on. They're being delivered. They're being deliver, uh, endure and then delivered into the blessings of of the kingdom. Come over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I've got to keep going so we don't fall behind the ticking clock. 1 Peter chapter 1. I would love to just spend hours with you guys going through these books. And maybe in the future we might do that. And seriously, start in Genesis and just go through them because it is such wonderful information. And your, your Bible is such a wonderful book. It ha I know what man does with it and how they use it to do this and to do that. But, man, when you just stop and go back and look, it's like, wow. It's, it's just awe-dropping. Aw, aw. Anyway, 1 Peter 1, verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation 
of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. You see, they're looking for the end, aren't they? The end of their faith. The end of their... We're, get, we're trying to get down here to the end. That kingdom. Verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the, at the revelation. Not by the revelation, but at the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. At his second coming, what's going to be there? The end. The kingdom is here. You see, it's written over here, focusing over here. They jump this completely, you and I today. Come on over to 2 Peter. I, well, I'm sorry, you're in 1 Peter. Look at chapter 2. Look at verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 9 is a fulfillment of Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6. So when 1 Peter 2, 9 becomes reality, which is right here in the second coming. It's one of the events of the second coming. That fulfills what Moses told them back there in Exodus 19 of what, their support, what, their, what God's hope was for Israel to be. What are they to be? A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of them who hath called you out of, of him, who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, when that happens, when they go into that kingdom and the light, the praise light shines on them. They fulfilled Exodus 19, 5 and 6. It isn't fulfilled yet. Then back here, not here today. There's no difference today. Now there's a difference, isn't there? Now we're back in to that program. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, and both which I stir up in your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may, may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, that's the twelve apostles, of the Lord and Savior. So what do we have? We have prophets, the Old Testament, the apostles, there's the gospels and early acts. Verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Where is he focusing in on? The scoffers, the last days. There's going to be some people out there that are going to say, hey, what's taking the Lord so long to get here? They don't understand rightly dividing the word of truth. They just think things just been ticking right along. There's been no, but God has delayed. That's why down in verse number uh, nine, the Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering. Hey, listen, man thinks God's taking a holiday. God didn't take a holiday. He's just what long suffering. Now you want to understand the long suffering. You come over here, verse 15, 16, you got to go study the Apostle Paul, his epistles, to understand the delay and why he's delayed his coming. You see, rightly dividing your Bible, rightly dividing the word of truth is critical, whether you're today in the age of grace or in Israel's program out in the future. Don't just think it's rightly dividing is just belongs to you and I today. Woohoo, we're special. God said it in very first verse, very first verse, Genesis 1:1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. He rightly divided the creation right off the bat. He's just now over here. Second Peter is looking out to the last days. First John. First John. First John chapter 2. I just want you to get the feel, the flavor here. Okay? The flavor of the Hebrew epistles is. Back to Israel's program. Circumcision is on board. You notice we haven't talked about a Gentile at all. It's all about Israel and her program. Okay? 
1 John 2, verse 18. Little children. Who's that? Israel. Little flock, specifically. It is the last time. As ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby when ye know that it is the last time. Do you think they're talking about the last time? He done said it twice in one verse. The focus is the last days. It's the focus is the conclusion of Israel's program. The establishment of the kingdom. And those steps that are designed to take and be taken. Jude. Jude 14. You ought to spend some time in reading Jude. Jude 14. Do you know that in Jude verse 14... And Antioch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. By the way, the saints there is Matthew 25. That's angels. It's not people. Okay? But do you realize that the only place that you know that Enoch back there in Noah's day ever talked was Jude 14 and 15? Jude's a fantastic little book about contending for the faith. Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Do you think they're ungodly? Man hasn't changed. And where are we? Where the judge has come. Second coming. Verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Here he's come, he's returned, he's judged, and now he's setting up the kingdom. And that's Revelation chapter 1. What's the flow here? Nothing about you and me. I know what people do. They run to James 2. Faith without works is dead. Well, look at my. But they fail to read James 1 1. James, the servant of Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Not talking to you and me. We're talking over here. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto a servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Revelation is a book of prophecy. It's written over here. About what? Over here. The last days. Okay? So Revelation, back here written, over here though is the subject matter. So when you come to Hebrews through Revelation, it's all bringing everything to a conclusion. You've got Matthew to John. They present the earthly ministry of the Lord to the nation of Israel. Here's your Messiah, and here he is. Acts comes in and presents the offer to Israel, but then the fall of Israel, resulting then in the salvation going to the Gentiles through the Apostle Paul. That brings us to Romans, to Philemon, where he begins to present the information concerning the dispensation of grace and the church, the body of Christ. Then we come to Hebrews through Revelation, which then presents the last days of Israel's program and begins talking to the little flock as he's going to walk them through the the events of the 70th week of Daniel on into the kingdom. So you've got the whole picture. And you begin to see the wisdom of God and putting it all together in this way. He starts, Israel, earth, earth, Israel, continues. Okay, 
interruption, back on task. So when somebody says, well, God's not, you know, God's, no, this is what God is doing. And you learn that by just simply reading the verse, reading the scripture, reading the book. You don't need anything. You just read. Now, come over to Hebrews chapter 6. If you fail to recognize the interruption of the dispensation of, of the grace of God, of Paul, the body of Christ, if you don't recognize that interruption, then you become a spiritual thief. Because what you do then is you begin to steal from Israel's program things that don't belong to you. And you're a thief. And you don't want to be a thief. You see, recognizing the dispensational distinctions is critical because not everything in this book is about you. And you got to get over yourself. Everything in this book is about who? God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It ain't about you. you know, you're not even on the pages half the time. It's about Him and what He's doing. Now, you and I participate in that. But it's about him and what he's doing. He's the father of glory. He's exercising a plan. He's exercising that plan out. And he's allowed humanity to come and be a part of it. When God made the covenant with Abraham, do you know that God made that covenant with himself and he allowed Abraham to participate? Got to go back and read Genesis 12. Read those verses. Read how it's written. God looked at Abraham and said, okay, I'm doing this with creation, with humanity, and you're my guy, so you can come and be a part. What did he do with Paul? Do you know that if Paul says, no, I'm not going to do that? You know, he says, here I am. (laughs) I'm ready to go. He would have used somebody else. He would have never talked to Saul of Tarsus, by the way. What about Noah? You ever think about Noah not, you know, I need you to build a boat. No, not going to do it. We'd have been reading about, Joe or Jim or Bill or Henry, would have, he'd have never talked. No, men of faith come in and say, here's the word of God. Here's what God's doing. Boom. You got to be patient with that. Why? Because the whole book is not, not everything in Scripture is about you. It's rather about what God's doing. And if you don't, if you don't recognize the interruption, the, the delay, the the temporary blindness of Israel. Then you begin to steal what God said to others and you begin to make it out like it's yours and it isn't yours, it's theirs. So you've got to be very careful, especially when you come to the Hebrew epistles. Do you realize that in Hebrews you can lose your, way to, you can lose your salvation six ways to Sunday? Just like you can in Acts, by the way. Why? Hebrews is a transitional book. It's going to transition not from dispensation of grace into this because it wasn't written that way. It was written to do what? To move from the old covenant to the new covenant. See? So when you think about, you got Hebrews 6. When you begin to think about what's going on here in the Hebrew epistles, you have to remember Hebrews 6 verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ... Let us go on unto what? Perfection. We're leaving this stuff back here. And we're moving where? Perfection. We're moving to some grown-up time, to an adult time. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. We're moving. Look back up in chapter 5 there at verse 12. For when... For the time ye ought to be teachers. What should Israel be? Teachers. But what are they? They need to be taught. Think about that. I'm going to take that down. They, who's going to teach them? Hebrews through Revelation. That's what John 16 said was going to happen. 
by the way, if you keep reading verse 12, ye, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, which for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of what? Full. Hey, we're going to move on to perfection. We're moving on to full age here, guys. And you need to catch up. But how are you going to catch up? Well, there's an edification process that lines up with what we've learned from Paul in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. And that edification process begins to line up now in the Hebrew epistles, so it will take them from baby to full age and do it quickly. They only got seven years. They don't have 25, 30, 40, 50 lifetimes. They got to get there fast. They got to get their movement. They got to get there quick. Now, 2 Timothy 3 16 and 17, you know the verse. For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. These make up the instruction in what? Remember? Righteousness. Well, what did Hebrews 6 1 uh, 5 say there? We need to take you on into righteousness. Perfect. Um, I just lost the page. Hang on. Five verse number. Uh, Thirteen. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he's a babe. We're gonna we're gonna have a little reproof, a little doctrine, a little correction. We're gonna come in and we're gonna talk about here's what we're gonna believe. Here's, how, well, here's what happens when we have issues, and here's how to correct, the, the fix the issues. Here's how to ID the issues, here's how to fix it, and here's the standard. That's the rule. And so you learn real quickly that the Hebrew epistles set up this design to take the believing remnant, the little flock, on into maturity. So you have the doctrine. The first book you have is the book of Hebrews. Okay? Then you have James. Then you have 1 Peter. Then you come to the next book, 2 Peter. Then you have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Johns. I call them the Johns. Then you have Jude. And then you have the book of the Revelation, and you don't need anything else after that because it's all done. It is finished. And what happens is, is you begin to, to take the Hebrew epistles, and you begin to realize that Hebrews focuses in on the cross. It focuses in on what the cross accomplishes for Israel, for the believer and the believing remnant. And it orientates them to the issues of God's grace. Hebrews does for Israel what Romans does for you and I in that it tells us all that is accomplished by Calvary and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Hebrews. That's where Hebrews begins. And as Hebrews comes in and begins to orientate the, the believer to, the, to God's grace, and that foundation of the establishment of the new covenant. Why? Because we're not going on to the old. We're going on where? To the new. And the new covenant in Hebrews chapter 8, 9, 10, all, is, is the new covenant is established by the cross work of Christ to Israel. So you have the new covenant is established, not because these are nice guys and good people, but it's because God, the cross of Calvary set the stage. It's the foundation, just as it is the foundation for you and I today in the age of grace. It is their foundation. That's why Hebrews sounds so much like Paul wrote it when Paul did not write Hebrews. Okay? You know who wrote Hebrews? God did. First word of verse number one. The human author is not needed to know. Hebrews sets the stage. Then you come to James. James, a book of reproof, 
because they're going to have some issues. They're going to identify some. He, uh, uh, James is going to focus in on the fruit of the kingdom that's produced by the faith of the little flock. So here's the fruit and the issue of faith. That's why it's Hebrews or James chapter 2 is that great faith without works is dead passage. It's going to be the fruit, their faith and the message given to them in that new covenant message given to them that they learn in Hebrews about the cross is going to cause them to produce fruit of the kingdom. Then you come to 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter, you begin to see it's a book of correction. They're going to have to endure. And what they're going to be enduring now is the satanic captivity. Because now there's an onslaught of the adversary against the little flock. And that onslaught is designed to carry the little flock away from that hope, their hope of the kingdom. The onslaught of the, of the adversary and the satanic policy of evil is to destroy their hope. They're ende- enduring the fiery trial. And if he can get them to destroy it, it's all done. You guys with me? We're not running a bunch of verses because we would be here for another hour, and I'm kind of getting hungry, okay? Just kidding. I'm always hungry. <laughs> All right? Then you come to Second Peter. Second Peter. You come now to another book of doctrine, and here's going to be the congregation, the church, we would call it. That little flock, that believing remnant, as they now are going to have to guard against the satanic onslaught. 2 Peter, they're going to begin to guard against the seductive nature of the adversary. That's why you you read about the false apostles and false prophets and false teachers What are they going to do in 2 Peter? They're going to come up and they're going to begin to seduce away. That's why Paul or Peter has to bring up Paul in chapter 3. And the answer, you want to understand the long suffering and why the delay? You need to go study your Bible and study Paul. That means Paul's in their Bible. See? That means when 2 Peter's written, Paul is finishing up his books, his epistles. See, what's happening, boom, there. There's a seduction here. There's, a, there's a, an onslaught against the, the, the congregation, the little flock, the church, to move them away. That blends us into the first, second, and third John, where they're going to begin to focus in on the test. There's seven of them in first John where the, the, that believing remnant can identify the true congregation versus the false congregation. It's in 1 John that we read for the very first time. Uh, look, look over at 1 John uh, chapter 2. We read a verse like this in Israel's writing, in the books written to Israel. 1 John 2, verse 19, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. In Revelation, in the church messages, he'll say, they are of the synagogue of Satan. You know what he's saying there? He's saying what Paul said in Romans chapter 9, all those of Israel are not Israel. You know what's going on? There's an apostate nation again, and then there's that little flock, and that apostate nation is not sticking around through the nasty now and now, the temptation and the enduring that's now on board that they've got to go through. You know what they're doing? They're down at the grocery store, cowboyed up, got their mark, and doing their business. While that believer sits over there and is enduring to the end. There's test in John. Jude then brings, you're going to go through the test? 
because you're contending for the faith. And Jude comes in and says, you know what? Just keep your nose down, keep your nose to the grindstone, and contend for the faith. I know Jude, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Why? Verse 15, a bunch of ungodly so-and-sos out there, and they're destroying, and they're destroying you. By the way, the destruction of the believer back here isn't mockery on Facebook. It's the firing squad with the real bullet. See? You think you go through it, you go through nothing compared to what these folks are going to go through. That brings us to the revelation. And here's his coming. Here's the kingdom. And the glory. And you know what? After that kingdom is established and the glory is there, guess what? There is no need for anything else. Come over to Revelation 22. Here's the coming of Christ and his reign in glory. And as Paul's epistles takes you and I through the edification process for us, the body of Christ, the edification process for the believing remnant, for that saint that's going to go through the 70th week of Daniel, sits right there. All of this, if you think about it, here's, here's, here's the wrath. Here's the 70th week, the second coming, the establishment of the kingdom, the inaugural thousand-year reign uh, where Satan is bound into the bottomless pit. That is designed to teach mankind, all of mankind, that the devil didn't make you do it. What made you do it is you are a stinking, rotten sinner. That's what you are. Then he's loosed. There's one more little skirmish, And then we've got the great white throne judgment. All of that is cast out into the lake of fire. Okay? And then we go into the new heaven and the new earth. Meanwhile, to get through here, they need all of that to make it through that seven-year period of time. Okay? How are you going to get through it? Here's the edification of it. Revelation 22, verse, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. What, what, what is the book of Revelation? It's a book of prophecy. Is God fulfilling prophecy today? No. He's interrupted it. So guess what? He ain't fulfilling revelation. Sorry, Charlie. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. You know what? It ends with the warning of don't add, don't subtract, don't mess with the book. Why? There's nothing more to add. There's no extra biblical information coming. It's done. Verse 20, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. By the way, just as Romans to Philemon links together, Hebrews links to James, James to Peter, Peter to 2 Peter, 2 Peter to the Johns, Johns to Jude, and the book of the Revelation. Same way. By the way, just as Romans link to, to Hebrews, they go this way too, in case you don't get sucked up in all the other need. It's very fascinating. Something for you to study. The overview. The tribulation saints, folks, needs the, the, this internal edification and motivation that's going to equip them to endure through all that is to come their way in the end. They have to. They're mere mortals just like you and I. How do you get through your situation? You've got to have the book. They need the book too. You are now, I, I, I got just 
several statements here I'm going to read because this is the end of the study. You're in possession now of the basic tools for a lifetime of profitable study of the Scripture. Time passed, but now ages to come. You've got it. You just got to take the pieces now and put them in the puzzle the right place. Nothing will ever be more wonderful or more powerful in your life than to have your faith resting on an intelligent understanding of all of God's Word, which allows that Word to bring the power and love and grace of God into your life for His glory. That's where we started eight weeks ago. I trust you'll make it a personal goal to have a daily intake of God's Word. And we'll continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It starts by just understanding the basics. We like to dump in all the details. And we fail the basics sometimes. And we've got to remember that. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you've given to us in your word, for making it known to us, for revealing it to us revealing you and all that we have in you. And, Lord, I just pray as we go now in the new year, we would think about these things and consider what your word says and give it the highest priority. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.